Hey everybody, welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. Just a reminder for all the new listeners that we have that I hear these stories for the very first time. I've never heard any of the stories Peyton is talking about. So all my questions and reactions are raw. Obviously for everyone listening right now, it doesn't sound very different, but we are doing something different right now live while we're recording Two of our very good friends came over. They're really good at podcasting, really good at filming. And so they are actually filming our podcast right now. And we are going to post it somewhere. So stay tuned as to where you can actually watch us tell the story. It's going to be really fun. So if we sound a little nervous, <laughs> that's, that's why. why. There's cameras <laughs> and lights on us right now. So. It might not feel different for you guys, but it's a little different for yeah. us. Okay, so I'm just going to jump right into it. First, I'm going to tell a story of... When Garrett and I, actually our very first date because it pertains to our story today. Oh no. (laughs) So uh, I hadn't ever met him before. It was a blind date and he came and picked me up and he didn't tell me what we were going to be doing that night. And I assumed we were just going to go, we were in college, so I assumed we were Mm -hmm. just going to go to some dorms and like hang out maybe in like a common area or something. He picked me up and we just started driving up the mountain and we just kept driving and driving and I lost cell service and okay obviously at the time i liked you immediately and so i wasn't like scared but you didn't know me yeah but looking back i'm like what the heck you could have been ted bundy i think we mentioned this in one of our other episodes that we were gonna tell it yeah it was pretty creepy yeah like (laughs) like you could have just been cute on the surface and Uh like wacko underneath and you took me up into the middle of nowhere and I didn't have any cell service. I didn't even like double think about it at like all. Like how creepy that would yeah. be. Well, I, I mean, I didn't think about it either until we were married. And I yeah. was like, what the heck? That was weird. We went into the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Seriously. We had a fire. Okay, guys. It went really good, obviously. But we're married now. Yeah. <laughs> if you didn't know, <laughs> I'm the married. wife and he's the <laughs> husband. Uh, okay. So let's jump into it. Uh, this case was suggested to us by Young Mal's. Um, she was on Instagram. She DM'd us. I had heard of this case before, but I'm really excited to tell you. Just giving some credit to my sources. There were a couple YouTube videos on this, so I'll have them linked in the episode notes if you want to go watch them. Omaha.com, journalstar.com, all that's interesting.com, obviously. I love them. Uh, www.1011now.com. I think that's like a local news okay. to where the story is. And um, investigationdiscovery.com. Okay, so let's get started. The date is November 14th, 2017, and we are in Lincoln, Nebraska. 24 year old Sydney Loof, who worked as a cashier at Menards, and I'm guessing that's just like a. Like a grocery store? Like a local grocery store, maybe okay. like. We have one called Smith's here. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing that's what it's like. But probably even smaller. Yeah. So Sydney. 24-year-old Sydney, had just matched with a girl named Bailey on Tinder. Okay. To clarify, both Sydney and Bailey are female. I don't want anyone getting lost because the names in this story could go either way. They could be boy names or girl names, so I'll clarify the gender. Yeah. Sydney was excited for the date. They talk on Tinder back and forth. Did you ever have a Tinder? I didn't. I didn't either. I actually didn't. I know. So whenever you mentioned that, I mean, we met on Instagram, so yeah. it's basically it's not that different. But not that yeah, different, but I mean, I I think you just like swipe. Yeah, you you didn't either, right? No, I've never had a Tinder, yeah. but I've heard of like swiping on Tinder mm-hmm. or something. So Sydney's excited. They talk back. So apparently, you can like DM or like message. Yeah, on you message Tinder. on Tinder. Uh huh. Back and forth, and they share roughly a hundred and forty messages with each other through the Tinder app. Oh wow. Yeah. So they decide to go out that night. And that night on their date, all they did was drive around. They smoked a bit, um, but they hit it off, according to Sydney. They plan on going out the next day, too. And Sydney shows her friends pictures of Bailey. You know, oh, this is a girl I went on a date with last night. I'm going on a date with her again. I'm really excited to go out again. Sydney sends a Snapchat out, and it was like a selfie with the caption, um, ready for my date with the hard eyes emoji. Okay. So she's obviously excited to go on a second date with her. Did, how old were they again? Did you say? Yeah. So 24. Sydney's okay. 24. I didn't say um, Bailey's, Bailey's age. age yet. The last message from Bailey to Sydney on Tinder is at 6.45 p.m. Stating that she's outside ready to pick her up for their second date. Okay. The next day, November 16th, 2017, Sydney Loof doesn't show up for her shift at Menards. Friends and family begin to worry. No one can get a hold of her, and this isn't like her. 
She would never miss a shift without calling in. She also wouldn't just leave without telling anyone. It's a huge red flag for everyone involved. Sydney's mother decides to report her missing after discovering that no one in Sydney's life had heard from her either since before she left on that Tinder date. And they also found that her cat was unfed, her purse was on her counter, and her Jeep was still in her driveway. Oh, that's so weird. Do you think your parents would call if you didn't go into work or something? Or do you think it, they would think it's not a big deal? Like if... It's hard because like you work I was from home. Still, yeah, but. yeah. Like right now, no. Yeah. I Maybe my mom... I call my mom every day. So I think it, after two or three days, she'd be like, if I hadn't answered and I hadn't called her, she would be like, well, what the heck? I can probably call you. Uh-huh. But I mean, I've thought about that before because yeah. we don't really, okay, me and Garrett are kind of hermits. So we don't <laughs> really see people all that often. So I'm like, who would be the first one to mm -hmm. call if like we didn't show up somewhere? Yeah. And no, how it's true. long would it take? Because they'd be like, oh, they're just working from home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would definitely be that I didn't call my mom or dad yeah. and you didn't call your mom. So sources actually differed on the timeline of how long it took to report her missing. Okay. So I saw one source that said it was like that the day that she went missing and another source was like it was four days after. So oh. I don't like I couldn't find a, a like An exact time. Yes. Mm -hmm. So with not much to go on, Sydney being an adult, so police don't, you know, immediately rush to judgment about her level of danger in the situation. Friends and family don't know what to do. No one knows the name of the Tinder date that she went on, but it seems like a good place to start considering that was the last time she was supposedly seen. The friend who Sydney showed a picture of Bailey to decides that maybe she can recognize the picture on Tinder if she saw it again. Oh. She creates a profile and starts swiping, literally swipes until she matches with the picture that Sydney had shown her. The picture that now had a name, 26-year-old Bailey Boswell. What? The friend attains Bailey's contact information and gives it to police. This was the last known person to be with Sydney before she went missing. I just want to say here, like, props to that friend. Yeah. Like, go off, mini detective. Like, she literally made a Tinder account and swiped until she went, okay, I think that's the picture she showed that's me. That's really smart. Yeah. So keep in mind, it's still a missing persons case at this point, but at least they now, you know, have a lead they can go off of. Upon investigation into 26-year-old Bailey Boswell, police discover that she actually has a 51-year-old boyfriend named Aubrey Trell, whom she lives with in Wilbur, Nebraska. 24-year-old Sydney goes on a date with 26-year-old Bailey, who actually has a 51-year-old boyfriend that she lives with. Got it. In so, Wilbur, Nebraska. Okay, so Bailey's dating a 51-year-old in Nebraska. But matched on Tinder with Sydney okay. and went on a date with her. They try to locate Bailey after, dis after discovering that Sydney's phone last pinged in Wilbur, hoping to interview her, but it seems as if her and her boyfriend, Aubrey, have taken off. This signaling to law enforcement as suspicious behavior, they obtain a search warrant for the couple's basement apartment after their landlord told police that there was a very strong bleach-like odor radiating from the apartment. Oh, no. Police find the place has been cleaned. The walls had been wiped down with bleach. In places, there were like bleach smears. Just bleach on everywhere. On the wall, yeah, and they're missing. Oh, great. All of this creating suspicion. Police announce mm. Bailey Boswell and Aubrey Trell, and keep in mind, Aubrey is the 51-year-old yep. boyfriend. Aubrey Trell as persons of interest in the disappearance of Sydney Loof. When this happens, media outlets obviously start reporting the update. It was at this point that to everyone's astonishment, Aubrey and Bailey post a series of videos on Facebook, still keep in mind, they're still hiding out from the police about their involvement with Sydney Loof. So cops go to their apartment and are like, hey, these people are persons of interest. Like this was the last person she was on the date with. Then they're trying to find them. So they go to media and say, hey, Bailey and Aubrey are the two people we're looking for. They're a couple and they're persons of interest in Sydney's disappearance and they're missing. And then media reports it and Bailey and Aubrey see the media reporting their names. Uh -huh. So they get on their Facebook and start making Facebook videos about Sydney's disappearance. So like in a negative way or saying they didn't do it? Yes. Saying they didn't do it. Like we have, we don't know anything about mm -hmm. So those. I watched the videos. You can watch the videos. They're online. So okay. I'll tell you a little bit about what they said in the videos. So the first video is posted on the 19th of November. That's just about two weeks after Sydney originally went missing. Yeah. 
It's a vertical video of Aubrey and Bailey in a parked car from the looks of it. And Bailey has a hoodie on. So the girl has Mm -hmm. a hoodie on with the hood over her head. And she also has like huge sunglasses on. So like, you know, on Mean Girls during the confession part when Damien like hides out in the gym in the purple hood because it's only girls in there, but he wants to go in and he's a guy. I don't remember, but I'm sure. So he like puts this purple hood on. He like ties it around it and then puts glasses on to hide. And in he's that this is the part when he's like, she doesn't even go here. I, I mean, I don't remember that. Part. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> so I'll post sorry. a picture of it. I'll post a picture. That's literally what Bailey looks like in the video in the car. Wait, so why would she be trying to disguise herself though? Well, because, because everyone knows what she looks like. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I <laughs> like, don't know. I think her. because they're like hiding from the police. Uh-huh. But I'm like, every, they've already posted your picture and your name. Like yeah. everyone already knows. Like, wait, nobody knows what I'm looking yeah, like. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's weird. weird. Okay. It's weird. And Aubrey, he's in the video, but his face is like halfway cut out. So it's just like his eye peeking in the video. Yeah. So it's just like an eye and then a voice talking and that's it. And then Bailey with her glasses in her. But I assume everyone knows what he looks like as well, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know. That's, that's the scenario of this first video. Got it. Just so you guys can kind of get a feel. So they talk about how their names are being slaughtered on the internet because of Sydney's disappearance. And since the police and everyone gets to talk about them, then they should be able to tell their side too. So that's why they're making the Facebook video. Okay. They say that despite what police are saying, they aren't hiding from them, even though they're like disguised in their video. Yeah. Um, And they have actually talked to the police multiple times and that all the leads in the case are actually from them. They're the ones telling all the police or telling the police all the information. They say they can't go back to their apartment because the police ruined it in the search. But, you know, we're not running. We aren't running from the police. They keep saying that. He says how much money they make, which is weird. What? He just says we make X amount of money? Uh Oh, 120K. Just for no reason? Yeah. He goes, and me and Bailey, we make 120K a year. He just like throws that in there That's randomly. That's so weird. So if you're in a, if you're a person of interest, can the cops arrest you? Do you know anything about that? So no, I don't think they can arrest you if you're a person of interest, but Bailey and Aubrey actually have warrants for separate, like separate uh, charges that don't involve Sydney. Okay. And so they technically could get arrested and that's why I think they're running. Okay. Got it. So yeah, so Aubrey says in the video, the cops have a warrant out for him for something else, but he isn't running. He literally says, I'm not wanted for anything. I'm pretty sure I have a warrant out for me though. (laughs) It makes no sense. Literally. So he's like contradicting himself the whole time, but talking like he's smarter than everyone, which we always see in these type of stories. Yep. He ends his whole spill by wishing Sydney and her family the best, but F the cops for ruining my life. That's how he ends his part in the video. So they're very defensive, both of them. Yes. And keep in mind, the whole time he's talking, the camera's on Bailey with just his little eye peeking in. Yeah. So then Bailey starts talking about how her and Sydney did go on a date and they did hit it off. She picked her up again the next night. Um, she says they went back to her apartment, which she shared with, with Aubrey, Aubrey. And they smoked a lot of things that I didn't even know what they were because she was like saying all these names and I didn't know <laughs> like, what they were. But and then she says that she leaves to go drop Sydney back off at her house. Bailey claims that at this point, Sydney asked that instead of being dropped off at her house, because she'd be dropped off at a friend's house. So she says she dropped her off at a friend's house, and that was that. She hasn't seen or heard from her since. She says that her and Sydney had actually made plans to go to the casino that weekend, but like she said, she never heard from her. Okay. The warrants that Bailey and Aubrey talk about in their Facebook video are for unrelated offenses, but this does mean that police can pick them up for any time if they find them. Got it. So everyone at this point is kind of like, you're not running from the police, but you were in disguise. You have warrants out. You're obviously not living in your apartment. So everyone just starts bashing them online, like on Facebook and everything. They're like, oh my gosh, these people totally killed her. Da, da, da. It just gets even worse for them. I feel like it would be hard to prove that they did it because their whole apartment was bleached, right? Mm-hmm. And if she really, I mean, like she said, she can just lie and say, well, we just dropped her dropped off her at off. a friend house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you've got you, two people saying it. How do you prove it? that? Yeah. Yeah. So at this point... The FBI gets involved in the search for Sydney. Um, Everyone involved, you know, kind of feels like something sinister had happened and that she didn't just run away. They begin searching ponds and creeks, but they don't admit why water. So they never come out saying why they're not like searching fields. They just are only searching water, but they never say why they felt inclined to search water. The police. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, the FBI at this point. Got it. 
Uh, they ask for help in the search for resources and whoever can volunteer their time to help. Obviously, just like any other missing person case that we see. Yep. Um, the FBI come forward to tell media that they have now been in contact with Bailey and Aubrey. So now at this point, they say, okay, we have contacted the missing couple. Oh, okay. On the 30th of November, Aubrey Trell and Bailey Boswell post another video on Facebook. Can you still see these videos? Mm -hmm. You can go back and watch them. I watched them. Oh, that's kind of creepy. And like, okay, Bailey is really pretty. So she's just like a young 26 year old, super pretty. And then Aubrey is like this 51 year old, looks like he eats cigarettes for breakfast. Like, I don't know. Like he just, he, he, they don't fit. Does yeah. that make sense? So the, the, the videos are just make it, they make it that much more like weird. Okay. The whole situation is just weird. So this time it's two vertical videos of Aubrey and then Bailey standing in front of a wall. So first Aubrey goes himself in the video and then Bailey does another video herself in it's the video. It's so weird just in front of a wall. Yeah. It's from the belly up and in Aubrey's video, his face is completely clear. So this time he's not hiding anything. But the best part of both these videos is that Aubrey is wearing like a zip up hoodie uh -huh. and he's not wearing anything underneath the hoodie, yeah. but the hoodie is only zipped up to like mid chest. And so there's like this little patch of chest hair right above the zipper, just like chilling there the whole <laughs> video. It just like gave me the EVGVs while I was watching. I felt like he like needed a little chain or something yeah, to go along funny. with it. So in these two videos, they say that they are taking the videos to prove it's them since everyone says they are hiding and running. So they show off their tattoos at one point. They're like, look, it's really us. We're not hiding. We're not running. Aubrey gets like really close to the camera at one point and like pulls his eyes really wide with his fingers. And he's like, look, it's me. It's me. It's Aubrey. And then he what? like does it with his mouth too. He's like touching his face like it's not a mask or something. So he's like touching his, his whole face saying like, look, it's me. I'm real. But he's like putting his fingers in his mouth at the same time. So the way he's saying is like, look at me. Because you like can't yeah. hear him because he's like messing up his face. It's so weird. That is so weird. And the police or FBI at this point haven't found any other leads? No. No. But they've talked to them, but they haven't found them. Okay. So in the video, Aubrey says that they've been reading the comments online about them and everyone thinks him and Bailey murdered Sydney, which is just ridiculous. He says that everyone says they either murdered her or, or sold her into human trafficking and then used the money they made at the casino that weekend. So like they're coming up with like scenarios, you know, like people like us, like true crime yeah. junkie people are commenting and being like, oh, they probably sold her into human trafficking and they used the money uh -huh. at the casino that weekend. You people should, like us yes. as in people like you. Me? <laughs> yeah so aubrey goes i'm a crook and i'm a thief but i'm not a murderer and i've never hurt a female in my life and he like emphasizes female okay he basically uses the whole video to comment back to everyone's comments on social media like he just addresses everyone's comments so everyone who was commenting congratulations you did get to him by the way <laughs> bailey's video is addressing a neighbor who talked to the media about them and she laughs about the thing that the neighbor had said but there's not like anything of like severe importance in her video the same day that they uploaded the second set of videos to facebook the fbi find bailey and aubrey in a hotel in Missouri, and they take them back to Nebraska on their other charges that their warrants were for. So did they find them by their locations because of the videos? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. And I don't know if when they had talked to them earlier, they had like discussed their location, but they felt like they didn't have enough evidence yet to bring them in and actually discuss Sydney. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the timeline was for. I watched like interviews with the FBI and the media, and they were super closed off about their reasoning or like if they even knew where they were at that point. So I assume it was because they have some sort of evidence that they didn't want mm -hmm. Something. them to know. Yeah. It's discovered at this point in the case after they've brought them back to Nebraska that at 1035 a.m., the day of Sydney's disappearance, both Aubrey and Bailey purchased a hacksaw, duct tape, utility knives, bleach, drop cloths, and tin snips. Oh my god! They were in the store. It was a Home Depot. Okay. They were, oh, Home Depot, my nemesis. <laughs> they were in the store for a total of 12 minutes. And all of this can be seen on the video surveillance. So, like you can go back and watch Bailey and Aubrey buying these things on the Home Depot surveillance cameras. Did they think that no one was going to see that? I don't understand. I don't know. Like, oh yeah, we're just going to buy all the stuff that's used to kill somebody. Yeah. And no one's going to know. Yeah. 
like it, it, especially with video cameras. Yeah, it's 2017. Yeah. It's not the 90s or the 80s. Yeah. So that same day that they, this was, so that day that they bought that was the day that she went missing. The okay. day they had their date and she went missing. Mm -hmm. So that same day as well, Aubrey Trell also paid a visit to the Menards where Sydney was working a shift before her date with Bailey that night. And in the surveillance video, he walks in, looks at Sydney, then in his pocket, and then back at Sydney, and then picks up his phone and calls Bailey before leaving. What? Yeah, Wait, so I'm confused, the day so. she went missing, uh -huh. and right after they had went and bought all of these, I mean, literally a murder, yeah, yeah, he goes to where Sydney's working, looks at her, checks his pocket, looks back at her, walks back out, and calls Bailey. That's so creepy. So it was like he was like checking in on her. I don't know, but he like goes, he doesn't buy anything from Menards. He just goes there to look at her. Or confirming it was her. Or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Or like confirming, yes, this is the girl we should kill. Okay. I don't know. Yep. Sources were kind of like iffy on this whole, whole detail. Like some of them didn't include it. So I just wanted to like clarify that and put that out there that some did, but some didn't mention it. And I feel like it's kind of a big part of the case. So I just wanted to like put that out there. On December 4th, 2017, the first of Sydney Loof's remains are found. A search team came across a trash bag in the middle of a ditch with an arm sticking out of it. Oh. And I just want to say a question here. How come murderers can never seem to get the full body in the bag when they're like dumping a body? Like, why is it always, oh, there was a piece of hair, like, like hair sticking out or an arm sticking out. I feel like we hear that all the time That's in so these sad. stories. I also feel like they always put them in places yeah. that can be found. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't her whole body that was found because she had been dismembered. Oh, no. Her organs were missing, including her tongue, kidney, and heart. Oh, so they totally sold them. I mean, that's what I assume. That's what I, I know. Too. There's nothing ever talking about them selling the organs. Uh-huh. Um, but that's what I would assume. Because I, I mean, you're, these you're, people, your kidney. Yeah, these people were like they stole a lot. They I don't. Were know. The tongue thieves. Okay. Yeah. 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 The tongue. Can yeah. you sell a tongue? I don't know. It makes me a little queasy. So <laughs> let's keep going. So p police were able to identify the body fairly quickly because Sydney actually had a tattoo on her arm that read, "Everything will be wonderful someday." Oh. And that just makes me sad because yeah. of the whole situation that that was what identified her. Yeah. So around six months after the first of Sydney's body had been found, Aubrey and Bailey are charged with her murder. Aubrey's defense team immediately tells media that it was a sex act gone wrong and Bailey had died accidentally of asphyxiation. So like, you know how you can like tie something around your neck and then like people do that in like a sexual way? Okay. So they're saying that they had done that. They were like all three involved and they were doing that and she accidentally died because okay. they were doing that. According to Bailey and Aubrey, Sydney's death was not premeditated. But when she accidentally died, they panicked and put her body in Aubrey's trunk, cut her up and dumped her. Oh, they panicked and cut her into pieces. Yeah. And, oh, that yeah. makes, that makes a lot of sense. And took her organs and sold them. Yeah, we took like six or seven hours and panicked yeah. and... Okay. So in a gel note that Aubrey wrote to Bailey, and they had to like decode it, I guess, he told her to tell um, the police about how they were going to actually make a video to sell with Sydney, but it went wrong when Sydney accidentally died. And he tells her to say that she had no idea that someone could get hurt. He says in the note to basically put all the blame on him and claim that she's innocent. Okay. Which, if the story was true, he wouldn't have had to be writing her to tell her what to tell yeah. the police. Things come out at trial that just make this case even weirder. Apparently, Aubrey was the leader of a sex cult, Bailey being no his sidekick. No way. They wanted Sydney, they say at trial, they wanted Sydney to join in this group. Aubrey claims that he had a relationship with Sydney too. He's like, oh, we went back. This, this was her first day with Bailey, but like we went back. She was all in, in being in my sex cult. So Aubrey claims at trial that he had this huge sex cult of women, which at the time of Sydney's disappearance was only Bailey. Let's keep that in mind. There was no cult. It was just oh. Bailey at the time of so Sydney's disappearance. So it wasn't like a big cult. It was just him and Bailey. There were other girls at one point. Okay. But at the time of her disappearance, it was just Bailey. Got it. He says that to, he told the women in his sex cult, and he didn't 
he's saying this as if he believes it. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling you that this is what he told them, but this is what he's telling people as well. Okay. He says that he is a vampire with special powers and he could fly and read minds. <laughs> so I'm just going to say, I wish he'd put some respect on Edward Cullen's name. Okay. He, so that's what he said in trial. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The women in his cult were required to call him daddy. Ooh. If you were able to join the cult, it's because you were a witch. What in the world? He would tell his witches that if they could go out and kill and torture other women, they too would get special powers like him. So did, did the defense team know about this? Or were they at this point like, oh yeah, my gosh. Yeah, I think they were using it to... Claim insanity? No. They oh. were using it to their benefit to be like, he really believes this. And it really was just like accidental death in their whole sex cult. Oh my gosh. So apparently the killings like to gain power if you were a witch. So if you were a girl in the sex cult, the killings had to be done as a ritual in the forest under certain moon phases for it to work, which I believe in moon phases, but I'm like, don't use them like that, you know? Yeah. Now I know this sounds bonkers and everyone at trial thought so too, but three women who are ordered to be kept anonymous come forward and testify about this sex cult at trial. One of them claims that she met Bailey Boswell on Tinder in 2017 and was convinced by her and Aubrey to join the sex cult. She was given a pretty healthy allowance of $200 a week to live at the house and be in the sex cult. She was taken to have spa days. She was treated really good. There were a couple of rules, though, like she had to walk naked around the house. She had to, like, participate in any of the events they wanted to do. She had to steal with them. That's so weird. And they, but they all lived in a basement apartment, you said, right? Mm hmm. So mm -hmm. they were just all just chilling in there. Yeah. So while she's testifying, she says, So I joined and I became a witch. So she like thought she was a witch. Mm -hmm. Okay. When she was in the sex cult. Um, she claims that she did refer to Aubrey as daddy and she believed that he could fly and read minds still. Police find a list of girls' names in Bailey's bag. That had certain powers written next to them. Like it would have been, like if it was me, it would have been like Peyton. X-ray vision. Like yes. just something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks. I could you're that. welcome. You're welcome. So Bailey was known as the queen witch. Okay. So Bailey's like the leader next to daddy vampire. And She's he's the like, queen the, witch. this went from a murder story to a weird book really yeah. fast. <laughs> so prosecution claims at trial that while Sydney was on a date with Bailey, Aubrey came out and strangled her with an extension cord. They claim that she didn't know Aubrey, that he just showed up on their date. Okay. They then cut her body into 14 pieces and dumped her in trash bags about an hour and a half away from her home. 14 pieces. Mm -hmm. Wow. Cops only found 13 of the 14 pieces. They are still missing her upper left arm. They could never find it. At trial, Aubrey pled guilty to improper disposal of the body, but not guilty to murder and conspiracy to commit murder. So he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We cut the body. We put it in trash bags. And I know that we shouldn't have done that. But wait, we didn't murder her. We She accidentally died. We just got rid of the body. So he's still claiming the whole sex cult. Yes, it thing. was an accident. Mm -hmm. Basically saying it wasn't planned. But like they literally bought the items they used to dispose of her body before the date. Yeah. So there were marks on the back and top of her head, according to journalstar.com. And Sydney also had restraint marks on both of her wrists. Oh, no. At trial, Aubrey used a wheelchair. So he like in his Facebook videos and everything, he's he's fine. Uh -huh. But then when they go to trial, finally, Aubrey is in a wheelchair. He gets wheeled into the courtroom. And I, I was unsure of this you know, all of a sudden need for a wheelchair. But if I had to guess, it was a tactic from the defense to gain sympathy. Yeah, from, from the, the jury. Jurors. Okay. So we've actually seen this a lot. And some say most recently we've seen this with the Golden State Killer who was just captured. He, there is video footage of him in his cell literally standing up like on top of his desk and like taping things, moving all around his room. And then when he goes into the courtroom, he's in a wheelchair and like senile. Like he acts like he can't move. He acts like he's not there. Like he's all old. and. But there's also video of him at the jail walking. Like wow. walking with the guards, not in a wheelchair. That's so messed yeah, up. Yeah, so people think that he was also using it to gain, well, his defense team told him to use it. To uh, it makes sympathy. sense, yeah. So in the middle of trial one day, 
This is weird. This is weird. And I will post a video of this on our social media. And if you are watching live on YouTube right now, I think we will show this video as well. So in the middle of trial one day, as another witness is coming up to take the stand, Mm -hmm. Aubrey's like in the corner of the courtroom sitting next to his team in a wheelchair. And all of a sudden randomly, he just yells, Bailey is innocent and I curse you all. And then he slits his own throat. What? At court. How did he have a knife? So we don't know what the weapon is or how he even got a weapon in the courtroom, but the, some sources say that it was a pen cap. Please be seated. Bailey is innocent and I curse you all. He just died. He just killed himself? No. So he slits his throat. Obviously, everyone, like you can see in the video, (laughs) people scream. And then everyone like rushes over to him. Well, he's at the courtroom. So they immediately get him to the hospital and he lives. Oh, man. Yeah. But there was like, he slid it enough that there was blood on the courtroom. Like they they had to stop the trial, clean up everything. I mean, I don't see all man is and I feel bad for him because I don't. Yeah. (laughs) That's just crazy. So well, I feel bad for the jurors and everyone who had to see that. Oh, totally. That's like traumatizing. So they paused the trial, um, and this is all happening in July of 2019. So when oh, this is recent. Mm-hmm. Okay, I didn't realize how recent this yeah, was. Yeah, because her murder was in 2017, and then it took a while, you know, for obviously them court to finally get that. to trial. So Aubrey heals, and he comes back to court to finish. This time, he has to wear handcuffs. So he's, like, <laughs> handcuffed to his chair this time. Yeah. Um, after only three hours of deliberation, Aubrey Trail was found guilty by the jury of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. So okay. they were like, it's premeditated. You bought all of it. You planned on killing her that day. Mm-hmm. So as of September 22nd, 2020, according to Bailey Bischoff with 1011now.com, sentencing hasn't happened for Aubrey yet. So as of a week ago today, and today is the 27th, I think. Uh-huh. Aubrey still hadn't been sentenced. But he's in jail. He's in jail. Just he's waiting for a sentence hearing. He will either get the death penalty or life in prison without possibility of parole. Got it. So that's what we're waiting to hear. And Bailey Boswell's trial hasn't even happened. I'm guessing all of this was originally pushed back because of Corona. Mm -hmm. Or maybe like court was just taking longer. But Connor Mannion with Oxygen Crimes News says, Aubrey Trell has a new sentencing hearing scheduled for December 15th at which point a panel of three judges will decide if he receives the death penalty or life sentence. He was previously scheduled to be sentenced in June, so they've now pushed it back to December. Bailey Boswell, um, who is also charged in the killing of Sidney Loof, will face trial on first-degree murder charges later this year. Her trial has been postponed because of a family emergency. I didn't even know you could do that. I didn't know you could do that. I didn't know you could be in part of... I feel like if you murder... Okay, Granted, she's not convicted guilty yet. Uh Uh-huh. But like... You can't be part of a murder and then go, oh, uh, I just got a family family emergency. emergency. Yeah, that makes no sense. So either way, Aubrey's hearing will decide whether he will be given life or death penalty. And if Bailey gets convicted of first-degree murder, it'll be the same decision for her as well. Death penalty or life in prison. And that's the story of Sidney Loof. Wow. So, but there's a lot of updates to come. Mm -hmm, because yeah so i'll be updating on social media murder with my husband on instagram twitter and facebook because his is set in december so we will hear whether he gets death penalty or life in prison and then her trial is coming up and we'll see if she even gets convicted geez some of these stories are just Mm -hmm. these blow my mind they're so crazy it's sad it's yeah so a reminder to stay safe out there Meet in public places for your Tinder dates or for your regular dates, okay? I know me and Garrett broke that rule, but don't do it. (laughs) Don't do it. Honestly, I'm lucky he wasn't a Ted Bundy. Seriously. You really never know someone. So just meet in public places, and I love it. And I hate it. Goodbye. Goodbye.